It's hard not for me when we sing that song, and there's a few others like it that, that use that great word, hallelujah, to, to just kind of remind myself and review in my own mind of what, what that means. Because it's, it's one of those rich Bible words that maybe we, we forget sometimes what we're even saying when we, when we make that declaration. It's a, I hope in explaining it, it doesn't take away some of the joy of it, but it's a compound word that, that connects two great words. One, halal, which means to say something is great. So you can halal just about anything. You can halal a great sunrise or a, a great sports victory. But in the Bible, it, it connects it to a second word, yah which is the name Yahweh, the name for God. And as we sing hallelujah, what we're saying is we believe God to be great. And if you trace the word through the scriptures, you'll find that it, it shows up throughout the Psalms, particularly the Psalms of Ascent. So as the people of God would gather as a nation and they would journey to Jerusalem from all ends of their nation and as they would go up the hills to the temple, they would sing these Psalms of Ascent and they often use that word. Hallelujah. They spoke of the greatness of God. And then, and then the word just disappears. Of course, the temple is destroyed. There's no more moments to, to ascend to the temple that is gone. And it doesn't show up again until uh, Revelation chapter 19. When we read once again, Hallelujah. For the Lord our God is almighty. And, and shortly thereafter, we have this great statement and vision of John who looks and he says, I looked and there is no more temple because God Almighty and the Lamb is the temple. And once again, we're able to sing hallelujah as we ascend into the presence of God. It's just a, a great reminder of the goodness and greatness of Jesus Christ, the one that we love and worship this morning. We're going to bow together in just a moment. Please uh, remember to be praying for the, the different issues and, and ministries and situations of people within our church family. There's a number of people looking for work, and so we just have a note there without any specific names, but just be remembering uh, those who are seeking out employment that God will provide and that he will guide them through, through this time of waiting that uh, it can become, if you've been there, it can become a spiritual trial as well as we wrestle with, with God and his timing, and uh, we want to just pray for those folks that are going through that. Of course, there's a number still dealing with physical illness, and we want to uh, remember them together as well. So let's do that now. Father, we are thankful that we can come before you, that we can sing of your greatness together this morning. And we are certainly in awe of how powerful and how good you are. We thank you this morning that you sent your one and only son to die on a cross and to take upon himself the punishment that was rightfully ours, your wrath that we could be forgiven and redeemed and restored into your family. And we thank you that you have given us this great hope that even though it's not yet fully realized, we sing this morning, hallelujah, in anticipation of this moment where we will one day stand in the presence of the Lamb who replaces the temple and replaces the sun and becomes the focus of all of our worship and all of our affection. And we thank you for him. Thank you that we can come with the, the concerns and cares of our heart for those that we love and that we care about who we watch go through hard things and it sometimes breaks our heart with the trials that those that we know go through. But we pray this morning, particularly for those who are seeking work, that you would be the one who would care for them, that you would sustain them, and that ultimately you would provide employment that would be able to meet their needs and the needs of their families, that would also serve your purposes. We think of those with cancer and illness, we thank you this morning for the news that Pat's daughter is, is in good shape, that the doctors found that the tests didn't reveal more cancer. We believe that is you acting on their behalf, and we're thankful. We continue to pray for Larry and Sue and 
For Warren as well, that you would care for that family through the trial they're enduring. We pray for Lori Lee and Jim and ask that you would sustain them as a couple. Father, we also want to pray for Pastor Bob and Kara as they are able to uh, enjoy a week of family vacation. We pray that it'll be a blessing, that they'll come back refreshed, having enjoyed not just the time of their own family, but as that whole family gathers from all around this province to spend some time together. We just ask that you would make it a, a phenomenal time, that their thoughts would turn to you as well as a family as they together love you and are serving you in various churches. We're thankful for them. We pray for our missions family this morning. And we are so thankful for the opportunity we have as a church family to participate in, in reaching the ends of the earth with the gospel. And even this afternoon as our missions team meets those people that are part of Emmanuel who give leadership to what we do as a church in terms of missions, we ask that you give them wisdom, that they would have great confidence and courage to lead us well in this. Now, Father, we pray that you would incline our hearts to trust your word. We confess that there's moments where we, we waver, where we don't see clearly, where our eyes are dimmed to the glories of your Son, and we ask this morning that we would have eyes to see clearly how truly great he is. We thank you, we love you in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> well, I had made a, a, a promise yesterday at men's breakfast, and by the way, if you are a guy and don't come to men's breakfast, make sure you come to the next one in March. They're a great time to uh, just kind of connect and fellowship and hear the stories that God's doing in one another's lives. But uh, I'd made a, a, a commitment yesterday not to reveal the score of the game uh, because apparently some of you recorded it with the intentions that you were not going to know what happened. <laughs> I remember the whole time thinking, that just seems like a somewhat far-fetched idea, but if that's you... Um, I hope you're still enjoying it. James, I must admit, when he waved the flag, I thought that, that gave away a little bit of the story, but we won't tell you exactly what happens. But, uh, but I did need to tell you uh, one scene from the Sochi Olympics that's kind of come to mind, particularly in terms of where we're going this morning in Mark chapter 5. Because I've heard a number of, of different reporters, and, and maybe you've heard this, where they, they do like the, the story from the ground is what they call it, right? Sochi from the ground level. And then what they do is they try to tell you, you know, the behind the scenes, what's it like to live there and what's the climate like? And probably if you're like me, you're learning lots and you're surprised. You didn't really know. It looked sort of like, you know, palm trees and things like this. It's not at all your image of what Russia was going to be. But, but they do it because they understand that depending on the, the distance you are from the actual scene and situation, your perspective changes a little bit. Now, as we come to Mark chapter 5, what I want to do this morning is actually go through these stories three times. The first time, it'll be a little bit longer. Uh, the second time, quite a bit shorter. And the third time, just very briefly. Because I think as we walk through the two stories at the last half of Mark chapter 5, there's at least three different levels that are going on within the story. So I kind of liken it to that moment, if you've ever been on a plane, that if you sit in your seat when you're still on the tarmac and look out the window, you have a perspective on what you see that that's sort of up close. You can see the people as they bring the luggage carts and they're all normal size. But then a few minutes later when the plane leaves the ground and you're you know, a few hundred or a few thousand feet up, your perspective changes. It's still the same physical location if you're sort of circling there, but you see it in a whole different light. The roads, the people, everything changes and you look out the window and the people are this big and, and you, know, you know that moment. But then once you get to about 30,000 feet, all of a sudden what you're looking at, although it might still be the same basic thing, your perspective changes once again. We want to do that this morning in uh, two scenes out of Mark chapter 5 in order to get all that I think Mark is trying to convey about Jesus Christ and the truth of who he is. So that's our plan for this morning. And uh, I did try to give a few notes on the back side of the bulletin there to uh, at least give you some idea how to follow along if you uh, find that helpful. <clears throat> Before we begin, though, I just want to read beginning in Mark chapter 5, verse 21. When Jesus crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet. And he implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. 
Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and spent all she had and was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she had said, If I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it, but the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside, and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him, and went in where the child was, and taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, Little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this, and he told them to give her something to eat. These are the last two stories in a series of four sort of rapid stories that are told in the Gospel of Mark in quick succession. We looked at the first two last week, if you're here with us. Firstly, the story of Jesus being out in a boat in the middle of a hurricane force storm that he was able to stop with simply a word that he speaks. And we saw from the story that Jesus has incredible strength. In fact, as the story goes on and as the Word of God continues to reveal, we're going to discover that Jesus has absolute power to do anything. The Bible will describe Jesus in the same terms that we use for God, and we, we describe that as omnipotent. Power beyond anything we've ever seen or experienced. Power without limits. The second story is Jesus coming to the other side of the lake after the storm has ended. He encounters a man who had been described as being possessed by demons, who had been very strong, and yet Jesus, in his even greater strength, was able to cast out the demons and deliver this man. And again, Mark seems to be making a point to show us how strong Jesus Christ is. Now this morning we come to the final two stories that Mark weaves together in order to kind of complete this little section in his description of the strength of Jesus Christ. Now last week we also kind of introduced one other idea, and that is that Mark loves sandwiches. And if you're here this morning and wonder what that has to do with anything, it's a, a literary device that Mark loves to use. And he's going to use it all throughout the rest of the Gospel. He uses it for the first time in chapter 3. He uses it here through these two stories in chapter 5. But if you were on your own to read through the Gospel of Mark, you're going to just see it increasingly common that Mark will use this way of telling stories. So what he does, just a quick reminder, he takes a story, he cuts it in half, and then he puts a story in the middle. Now oftentimes the stories actually unfold that way in real life. So it's not Mark changing the story so much, it's just the way he he writes them and describes them for us. He, he does it because there is something in those two stories that he connects that communicates more than each story does on its own. It's, it's that sort of, you know, phrase that we've got that, you know, the, the total is more than the sum of its parts. There's something that gets communicated more clearly when Mark does this than would have happened on its own. This morning, Mark does it with the story of two women. Two women who both have critical medical situations, two women who are both at the end of all that is humanly possible in terms of deliverance or treatment, two women that short of the miraculous intervention of God are without hope. The first story 
It begins in verse 22. In essence, we find out that Jesus, verse 21, has crossed over yet again from the one side of the Sea of Galilee back over to the Jewish side of the Sea of Galilee. And as he gets to the other side, he is encountered by a ruler of the synagogue. Now, just a quick note here before we get into the story. At this point in Mark's gospel, Jesus will very rarely now enter a synagogue. Up to this point through chapters 1, 2, and 3, it's a common situation for Jesus to travel to a certain place. And he goes there, and he enters the synagogue, and he begins to teach, or he begins to interact with people. We saw that was his pattern all through those first three chapters, until this moment in chapter 3, where the scribes and leaders of the Jewish religion come from Jerusalem. They encounter Jesus, and they accuse him of being possessed by a demon and a practicer of sorcery. And from that point on, there is an incredible divergence between Jesus and the synagogues and Jesus and the Pharisees and religious leaders. And so we're going to see that the only time Jesus enters a synagogue from this point on is chapter 6 when he goes to his own hometown. It's the last time he enters a synagogue. There he's rejected. And from that point on, he will only ever enter homes. You'll find him in the countryside teaching, but no longer in the synagogues. But here, interestingly enough, after Jesus has been rejected by the religious leaders, after Jesus has no longer been welcome in the synagogues, a ruler of the synagogue comes to Jesus, bows at his feet, and begs him. I suspect that this is one of those moments of last resort. I, I suspect this religious leader is doing this because there was no other hope. He'd been to the doctors, he'd prayed, he'd done everything that was in his power to do to try to see his little girl made well. And now, in an act of utter desperation, he comes to Jesus. We understand as he does this, it probably puts his standing and position within his own community, his own esteem, his own honor, it puts it all in jeopardy. But he's willing to do it because as we find out in the Gospel of Luke, this is his only daughter. This is it. And she's dying. Now in Palestine at this time, we know from historians who describe this, about 60% of kids didn't make it to 16. I mean, an incredibly high number of children died. And so, although it wasn't uncommon for this man, this, this was his only daughter. And he is prepared to do anything it takes to see her made well. And so he comes and he bows at the feet of Jesus and he implored him and says this in verse 23. My little daughter is at the point of death. Come lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. Now it's interesting if you read what happens next in verse 24 because here's, here's what I think many people would have done at this precise moment. Not Jesus, but many. At this precise moment, they would have said to this synagogue ruler, Oh, now you come. Now you bow at my feet. Now you want something of me. Sure, now you want to honor me. Now you want me to come to your home. Because now, after all this time, he's finally become so broken and humbled that he comes to Jesus. But before he doesn't, before the religious leaders are, are mocking Jesus and accusing him of all sorts of terrible things, they have already acknowledged that he has a supernatural power, but they have actually said the power comes from demons. And now this man wants Jesus to come. Now this man is dependent on the power that Jesus possesses. And isn't it something about us as humans that when we finally get someone at a vulnerable point, when we finally have triumph, when we finally see weakness in others, isn't there something that we tend to want to take advantage of it? Oh, now you need me. Now you want something of me. After I've already won, after I've already... I think Jesus is helping us understand something. If we truly want to be fashioned into the image of Jesus Christ, at that moment of temptation, when we can lord it over someone else, when we can dominate or get our own way or humiliate, Jesus says we must always resist. I think one of the things that Mark's going to show us, I suspect from this point through at least the middle section of the gospel, is Jesus is actually going to demonstrate how we are to live as truly human. Now, be careful with that because I don't mean by that that Jesus is not the Son of God. But what I do mean is he is going to demonstrate for us what it means to be 
truly fashioned into the image of God and to treat others as true image bearers of God. He's going to demonstrate what this looks like for us. I think it's one of the things that we need to take note of because as we've talked over and over in the Gospel of Mark, we have been freed from sin to follow Jesus Christ. And as he demonstrates it, this is what it looks like to follow Jesus. So at that moment in your marriage, when finally you have your spouse stuck, instead you sow mercy. Amen. And, and in the workplace, when you finally have advanced and can can lord it over someone instead of doing that you show compassion because that's what it looks like to treat others as though they are made in the image of God and Jesus does it doesn't point it out doesn't make him grovel doesn't belittle him instead he simply goes now that's the first half of the story and if we were to follow that story along, we would realize you'd have to jump down to verse 35 because that's where it continues. And in between these two verses is the next, it's the filling of our sandwich, the next part of the story, because this is not the only critical situation going on here at this moment. We see Jesus goes with the man, and a great crowd follows him in verse 24. They're all thronged about him. They're all pressing in on him. And then in verse 25, we meet another woman. This woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years. She had suffered much under many physicians and spent all that she had. Now, probably if you're like me, you're thinking to suffer much at the hands of many physicians meant that you went to the doctor and there was some sort of difficult process medically that you had to go through. There was pills that you had to take that, that affected you physically. Surgery you had to went through that was painful, that was somewhat crippling, but you all did it because you wanted to get to the point of health again. That's not what's going on in Mark chapter 5. We actually have some of the historical textbooks for medicine at this point. You want to know what one of the prescribed treatments for a woman in this exact condition was? If she had a discharge of blood that was not stopping, she was to go to the corners of two major roads. And she was to stand there and yell out in a loud voice, I am sick and unclean. And she was to continue doing that in the hopes that someone would be able to sneak up on her and scare her. And maybe she'd be made well. <laughs> I mean, we laugh because we recognize that's not going to work. It sounds more like how you, you, know, you teach your kids to treat hiccups, like stand on your head and try to scare. We see the silliness of it, but make sure you also see the humiliation of this. The suffering that had happened much at the hands of the physicians was not, not a physical suffering. It was an absolute humiliation that this woman had gone through for 12 years. And then at the end of it, she had spent everything she had and had nothing. In fact, not only did she have nothing, she was worse off than when she began. The condition just continued to progress. Now, I can speculate just a little bit more on one other thing here because, again, we know some things written around this time that had she been married, which likely she was because that was just sort of how things were done, the idea of being single in, in this time was a fairly rare idea. Had she been married, her husband actually would have been instructed to divorce her. After all, this woman would have been always unclean. She would not have been allowed to go to worship God. She would have not allowed to have been able to live within society. And her husband would have been told that the righteous thing to do would be to divorce her and leave her alone. Much like that scene where Joseph, after having heard that Mary is pregnant, decides, remember how scripture tells us, being a righteous man, he decides to divorce her quietly. That's because he's been instructed that the righteous thing to do is divorce her. It takes God's intervention to stop that. And this woman is completely and utterly on her own and to the end. And she decides something. She says, if I touch his garment, I'll be made well. And there in the middle of the crowd as Jesus is on his way to a critically urgent scene to care for a young girl who's dying, this woman, in an act of faith, reaches out and touches Jesus. Now, I don't know why she thought that that was going to heal her. I mean, that's an interesting question to, to kind of bat around in your head a little bit. Certainly in the Old Testament, there, there is some precedent to the connection of great 
men of God and their garments. It's sort of an odd thing if you think of the story of Elijah and Elisha and the passing down of the mantle, all these kind of things. If you think of the story of David and Saul when they're one day in a cave and Saul has been pursuing David and trying to kill him and David is there hiding in a cave when Saul comes in to use the facilities and David has a chance to kill him. Remember what happened? David takes his his knife, and he actually cuts off just the edge of Saul's garment. And right afterward, David is absolutely remorseful. It's a funny thing, because to my ears, I think, well, David, I mean, you've got really nothing to be sorry about, because this man was trying to kill you, and you actually showed him mercy. Why do you feel so badly? The answer being that in his culture, in his understanding, to cut or destroy someone's garment, particularly the kind of garment Saul would have been wearing, probably a very expensive, very ornate garment, was actually considered a grave insult. That's why David's so remorseful of what he's done. He's, he's touched, he's insulted, the Lord's anointed in the moment. So this woman reaches out and touches Jesus. Want to know maybe one other possibility? If you go and read Exodus 28 and 29... There's an interesting little scene speaking of the altar where the people of God come to meet and worship God and they, they're instructed that if something unclean touches the altar, the altar is so holy that it will actually make the unclean thing clean. I don't know if that thought went through her head. Maybe Jesus is so holy. Maybe he is so clean that even though I am unclean and I shouldn't be in this crowd and I should be on my own, I should be ostracized, maybe, maybe, maybe if I just could just touch him, something of his cleanliness would just sort of spill over. I don't know if that goes through her head. What I do know is that in that action of reaching out and touching him, she's made well. What I also know is that Jesus knew it. And in the middle of the crowd, he stops. And turns to his disciples and says, Who touched me? And they answer with the obvious statement, Come on, Jesus. You've got to be kidding. I mean, this is a huge crowd. There's all these people. It could have been any number of people who touched you. How are we to ever know who touched me? Now, of course, surely Jesus knew, right? I mean, Jesus knew the heart of every person. He knew everything. I think this is like that scene in, in Genesis where Adam and Eve sinned and then God comes along and he calls out and he says, Adam, where are you? I mean, do we really think God didn't know where Adam was? Well, of course not. God just wanted Adam to have to declare something. I think that's what's going on in this story. Jesus, I think, knew right from the moment this woman had begun to pursue him that she was there, that she was the one who had reached out and touched him. He just needed her to declare something. And she does in verse 33. She came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he turned to her and said this, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace, be healed of your disease. Now we're going to come back to that statement in lap two. All right, when we get a few feet off the ground and have another look at this. For now, we're just going to set that one to the side. Because in the meantime, the thing that we feared most happened. I mean, isn't the thing we feared as Jesus slowed down to encounter this woman? That this little girl who was in such critical condition might die? I mean, that's how it feels to me as I read the story. I say, Jesus, you've got to hurry because she is, at, she is at the last moment. She's at death's door. Don't stop for this woman. Come back for the woman. I mean, she's been sick for 12 years. She can wait. And then we find out in verse 35 that the very thing we most fear happens. Messengers come from this man's home and inform him that his daughter's died. And they ask him, why should we bother troubling the teacher anymore? But Jesus overheard this little conversation and he said to the ruler of the synagogue, don't fear, only believe. Now again, I ask myself the question as I hear that, believe what? I mean, after all, it was one thing to believe that Jesus could heal because he'd done that through the Gospel of Mark. Those stories were well known. That's why people brought sick people to Jesus because he had healed other sick people. But what are you supposed to believe now when Jesus says, don't fear, only believe? We're past the point where healing's possible. Now we're to the point of death. Well, for Jesus, we're going to discover very quickly, there seems to be no line. The issue of healing someone who's ill and making them well or bringing someone back from death and making them alive is a non-issue for Jesus Christ. 
And so he allows no one to follow. He brings some of his disciples with him. He comes to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and sees a commotion because a funeral has started. And that's what's going on through these couple verses. They are weeping and wailing loudly. Probably these are professional hired mourners. Now in our culture, when we come to a funeral, it's understood that we're supposed to hide emotion. You're not supposed to cry. You're supposed to try to be strong and, you know, the stiff upper lift and, and maybe privately on your own, but, but not at that moment. But in Jesus' day, it was the complete opposite. In fact, it was so much the opposite that it was very much acceptable or the norm to actually go out and hire professional mourners whose job it was, was to weep and wail as loud as they could in order to generate emotion in other people. So that it would kind of spill over so that everyone soon was feeling absolute grief and agony over what's happened. And Jesus has walked in at that moment and asks them a question. Here it is. Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead. She's sleeping. Now the reason I think they're professional mourners is because in that moment they turn off the switch and they begin to laugh and mock him. Doesn't he understand the difference between life and death? He thinks she's sleeping? Clearly Jesus does. He understands the difference between vital signs and the absence of vital signs. He's not confused that somehow she's actually really just sleeping and everyone else has made the mistake. No, he understands exactly what's going on. He's just got so much strength. Death can't stop him. He put them all outside, took the father, mother, those who were with him, and went into where the child was. And then make sure if you got your Bible open that you look very closely at verse 41. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. Now, <clears throat> this is one of the few times where Mark actually preserves the words of Jesus in Aramaic. Now, Jesus would have spoken Aramaic, not Greek, but Mark writes in Greek, not Aramaic. And so what Mark usually does is he translates the Greek, or sorry, the Aramaic words of Jesus into Greek so that the people reading it understand it. Except for a few very rare occasions. There's a moment in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before his arrest, where Jesus is there in absolute anguish, and he cries out to his father, and he says, Abba. It's Aramaic. The Aramaic word for dad. If it was possible, you could take this cup from me, but not my will but yours be done. Another moment on the cross. Eloi, Eloi, lama, thabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Moments of absolute emotion and intensity. And isn't it interesting that one of the other few, I think there's maybe one other moment, is this one right here. Doesn't it make you wonder, why does Mark want to keep that word there? Here's, here's what I think. It's because for one brief moment, we learn that not only is Jesus infinitely strong, but he is also filled with compassion. Now the word is not exactly what, what my translation says. It says, little girl I say to you arise. That, that misses the heart of what actually that Aramaic word was meant to say because it's actually a pet name. The, the word actually is not really technically the word for child at all. The word is actually little lamb. It's a pet name. It's the kind of word you use when you've got a, a two or three year old little child and they're in bed and you say, I want to wake them up from their nap. And you walk in quietly and you don't just pound on the door. And, no, you walk up and you come right next to them and you say, sweetie, it's time to get up. I remember doing it as a dad. Honey. You stroke their head. In our family, it was peaches. That was our daughter. Peaches. Don't tell her I said that. They were in the first service. I didn't tell the first service that. She'll kill me. <clears throat> it slipped. Right? You got the name, that affection, tender name that you use. That's what Jesus does right there. He comes to this little girl. Now, he could have stood at the door and said, I command you arrive. He doesn't. Why doesn't he? It has nothing to do with his strength. It has everything to do with us being allowed to see the heart of Jesus Christ, who not only has infinite strength, but he loves us so much that he would say this so that we'd understand his heart, his mercy, and his compassion. Can you imagine the scene? She's dead, and he comes to her and just says, 
sweetie, it's time to get up. And you read what happened next. She gets up and walks. Now perhaps you're struggling with a situation in life and it's good to know that Jesus is strong. It's important to know that. I've been saying that over the last few weeks. If you're facing a trial, a hardship, a difficulty in life, it's important, critical to know that Jesus is strong enough to deal with it. But probably there's another question that nags in the back of your mind if you're going through one of those scenes, one of those moments, one of those trials. If he's strong enough to deal with it and I'm still going through it, does that mean he's not good enough or loving enough or compassionate enough to care about me? This story teaches me that he is. He's not only strong, he loves me. And if the hard thing I'm going through continues, it must mean there's another piece of information I don't yet have. And so we continue to trust him. Now, in the third flyby, we're going to get there in a minute, I think there's an ultimate answer because ultimately we understand as followers of Jesus, he has dealt with these things. There's coming a day where there's no more death and tears and all those great things that we have as our hope. But for this point, just make sure you see it. Jesus is strong and Jesus loves you. That's the scene from the tarmac. Now, once we get up a few feet and we go back over our story, something interesting begins to happen. The stories that looked so similar between Jesus interacting with this girl and Jesus interacting with this woman that, woman that seemed like Mark wants us to connect them, even to the point of telling us that one was sick for 12 years, the other was 12 years old. I mean, Mark wants us to look and say, these stories are a lot alike. Once we get up a few feet, all of a sudden, we begin to realize that the stories are actually extremely different. The points Mark draws your attention to from the fact that we're told the name of her father. In fact, he points out Jairus by name, and on the other hand, the woman who comes to Jesus is left anonymous. That's very different. On the one hand, we have a family held in esteem within their community. This is a ruler of the synagogue, a position that is given because you are affluent and you are considered to be held in high esteem by your community. On the other hand, a woman who is nothing, the lowest of low, a social outcast because of her condition. On the one hand, a family that would have been very wealthy. There was no pay that came with the job. Synagogue ruler. It was not a paid position. You got it because you already had resources. On the other hand, a woman who had spent everything. She was penniless. You see the contrast all of a sudden through the whole story. One condition that, that's chronic. It's been going on for 12 years. The other that is absolutely critical. We are moments away from death. The, the stories are actually very, very different. But the most important difference is actually the one surrounding faith. Because in the one story, we're told that this faith is commended. And in the other one, we're told that they need to stop fearing and only have faith. And these are very two very different things. And what's most interesting of all is that the one where we would expect there to be faith present, the ruler of the synagogue, the religious leader, the man who had come and bowed down before Jesus, he is not the one whose faith is commended. It's the woman who tries to come up anonymously, slip in, touch Jesus, and disappear. Never, hopefully, to be noticed again. And what on earth is happening? Well, I think it's a story that helps challenge us in our understanding of what faith is all about. See, we have redefined faith, for the most part. If you talk to people about what faith means for many people in our world, maybe for even some of us, we, we understand faith to be the religious system to which we adhere. We might say, what's your faith? Well, I'm a Christian by faith. Or someone else might say, my faith is Hinduism. We mean it's like a set of ideas that we have said we believe them to be true and so we identify faith as a label. It's not biblical faith. Other people say, well, faith's not so much maybe about that. It's more about the strength or the sincerity of the believer. And so you hear things like this as people talk. It doesn't really matter what you believe. It's just, you just got to be sincere. That is not biblical faith. And I think this story is meant to help us understand. In fact, I think we so often misunderstand it that we read verse 34 where Jesus says, Daughter, your faith has made you well. And we conclude, this woman had such great faith. It was her faith that made her well. And then we go on thinking somehow that 
my wellness or not wellness, my success or failure is somehow contingent on the strength of the faith that I possess. That's not biblical faith. Biblical faith has everything to do with the object. Everything to do with the place in which your faith has been connected. In the case of this woman, it is just simply one reach out to Jesus. The reason her faith has made her well is because she touched the right person. Jesus, the object of her faith, who will never fail. Amen. Now that's why Paul will speak to the Corinthians and he says something like this. He says, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, if he didn't die and really rise from the dead, then you are to be pitied above all. Now, every once in a while, I've, I've, actually I've thought this myself and I've heard others say it. It's like, well, you know, you might as well become a Christian because even if we're wrong, have you ever heard this? Even if we're wrong, it's still a great way to live. I mean, you live clean and you kind of get along with others and it's pretty happy and you go to church and lots of nice people and we got great programs. And so even if Jesus didn't die and rise again, why not follow? Paul says that is absolutely ludicrous. I mean, we would be the greatest fools on earth if the object of our faith is not true. But, but the object of our faith is true. And this woman is healed because she reaches out to Jesus. And you will never be disappointed if you reach out to Jesus. just as a little aside, if you're wrestling through this whole thing and trying to decide whether you're going to follow Christ or not, never be bashful about coming to Jesus for what you get. <laughs> it's not to say that we treat Jesus as our butler because he is not. But we all come to Jesus for what we get. We don't come to him with stuff to give to him and bring to him. We come because he is the only one that can meet our needs and answer the questions of life and bring us safely through death to the other side into the presence of his Father. Amen. Now, that's the second level. We, we just have one more level to go, just a few feet higher. Because there's one other thing going on in this story that I think we need to see and understand. One other truth that we need to grab hold of and never let go of. All throughout Mark, We've seen time and time again that Mark just keeps connecting dots back to the prophet Isaiah. He did it through the stories of the parables. He did it way back in chapter 1 when the great scene of Jesus being baptized and the heavens are rent and it reminds us of that great scene. I think it's Isaiah 64 where Isaiah says, Oh, the heavens were rent and you would come down. It's just a, a way that Mark uses to help us understand that Jesus is God. The heavens were rent and when Jesus is standing there, it is God that has come. We saw it last week in chapter 5 in the story of the demon-possessed man where Mark points out a couple things about this man. He's living among tombs and he's living there among the pigs. And then he points out this great tragedy that the people there reject Jesus. That's just a living out of Isaiah chapter 65. Where in Isaiah chapter 65 we're introduced to some people who live among tombs, who live among the pigs, and who reject God. And Mark just wants us to understand that in rejecting Jesus they're doing exactly what the Isaiah... Isaiah prophecy had foretold years ago. And so wouldn't it be interesting in the last two stories if there was something from Isaiah? I mean, it would seem quite fitting if Mark wanted us to see a couple things out of these stories that linked back to Isaiah, particularly if they fit within the last few chapters of Isaiah because that's where he's drawn a few things. So if you've got your Bible with you, turn with me just for a couple moments to the end of Isaiah chapter maybe around 64. 65, somewhere in there. <clears throat> and I just want to point out a couple things. One for you to maybe think on a little bit on your own and one final thought as we bring our time in the word to an end and then respond in song. In Isaiah chapter 64, right after we hear those words of heaven being rent and God coming down, there's a scene, a description of judgment. There is a reminder <laughs> That there is nothing that we bring. There is no goodness, no deeds that are good enough that we can somehow earn the favor of God. In fact, we come to an incredible statement in Isaiah chapter 64, 64 verse 6. Where we're told, We have all become like one who is unclean. 
just like the woman in our story who was unclean. And all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. Now that garment, that's a technical thing. That's not just sort of a, a, a piece of clothing that got dirty. That's actually a specific menstrual garment that's become polluted and foul and unclean. And that's not me making that up. That's what Isaiah says. And then all of a sudden, if we remember back to our story in Mark chapter 5, isn't it interesting that we encounter a woman with this exact problem? And is it possible that what Mark wants us to do is connect some dots and realize that this situation of uncleanliness is finally remedied in Jesus, the Son of God, the one who is able to make what is unclean clean? Give that one some thought sometime, but the one I really want you to see and where I want to end is in chapter 65. Because in this story today, in Mark chapter 5, we encountered this scene of wailing and weeping and a little girl whose life was cut short. And in Isaiah 65, we read this, verse 17. This is the hope that we hold to. This is what we look to. This is the promise that we hold because of Jesus Christ. Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. Now pay careful attention to what happens next. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping or the cry of distress. Just like in Mark, Jesus encounters the scene of weeping and distress. No more will that come. And then this in verse 20. No more shall there be an infant or child who lives but a few days or an old man who does not fill out his days. And what Mark wants us to see is that in, Ma in Ma Mark chapter 5, we have a small foretaste, it's like the appetizer, it's like just a glimpse into this promise coming true. That one day, this scene where this little girl has died and the family is in grief, there will be no more scenes like that because God has made promises. He will intervene. And we look forward to a glorious hope. A new heaven, a new earth, no more sun, because the Lamb who is slain will light heaven forever.